raise our hands to to our Father as children of God today. I, there's so much energy in this church this morning. God, I feel like we have, I feel like we have adequately worshipped you today, God. I feel our hearts rising up to you. We raise our hands to our Father this morning, God, and we just reach up like a kid reaches up. I think about land, and he came every time he comes running, I have to turn sideways or he'll tackle me. And he jumps up as high as he can to get to my shoulders. We do that to you with our worship this morning, Father. You're a good Father, and we reach out to you as you're reaching out to us. And that's awesome. Thank you, God, for filling us with love, for filling us with your spirit and compassion. Amen. Thank you, Father. Man, guys, it's such a good atmosphere this morning. Amen. Well, you can, uh, you can uh, reach over and shake somebody's hand this morning and make a new friend. I'm Chuck. So uh, in case you're watching online, you're wondering... Uh, while we're dressed like this today, we, uh, that's probably normal for this church. It's kind of hard to have like a crazy dress up day because we're going to be weird. Okay. <laughs> I think we are. Uh, but no, uh, just uh, thank you guys for joining in. It is fun. I told Emily, I can't wait to go to church in my bathing suit, man. It's going to be awesome. Um, and speak this morning. I wanted to just say a couple things today. I uh, wanted to thank those who came yesterday to do our, we had a work day yesterday and you probably don't see it in here, but out in that end of the building, there was lots of work that took place. And uh, those of you who did help, if you're here this morning, uh, maybe they're in bed right now, still trying to recover. Uh, but we stand up real quick so we can recognize you real fast. We want to just say thank you. Come on, come on, come on, raise. Thank you. I'm going to tell you right now, Al is no joke, man. I would take him over over a teenager slash young adult any day. That guy can work circles around anyone I know. Um, so thank you, Al. I couldn't keep up with you, man. I tried. And I uh, wanted to tell you, okay, a couple things. Can you guys see me? These glasses are so dark, I can't see you. Uh, so, so anyway, um, no, I did want to say that uh, this morning at the end of service, and they'll tell you more about it in a minute, we're going to be baptizing people in our new portable baptismal tub, which, by the way, is in preparation for uh, the renovations. We're going to lower the stage, which means we'll have to pull out that baptismal because it's, it's up too high. Hey, man, that, that was a good old baptismal. Um, and... So we're going to be lowering it down third step, and I'll actually start preaching on the platform, which would be really nice uh, to be able to do that, but, uh, so I can have, like, level up on you guys. Just kidding. Um, but the, uh, the baptismal today, and there was all kinds of people who were like, I'm getting baptized, I'm getting baptized, uh, and then all of a sudden, now we're down to, like, two people on the list. And so here's what I'm doing. I'm begging you. If you have not been baptized, today is the day. As long as you don't have a white shirt on, females, uh, we can, and as a matter of fact, we can get you some other clothes if you need to. Uh, we would love for you to sign up and do that, and you can do it right up to the last minute this morning. Just let one of our leaders know, and we'll make sure that you guys can do that. And uh, I'm, I guess it's my job this morning to receive the regular tithes and offerings. Woo! Thanks for that enthusiasm. Um, I'm excited. We've got a party going on today, and I, uh, I don't want to oversell it, but I, I honestly believe I'm sitting on one of the greatest messages I've ever prepared. And so I cannot wait to, to give this um, scripture. You know, when it comes to giving, I would rather your basis rest on God's word than coercion from a, a, a good speaking, a, a good speaker. You know, you should give. Or I'd rather, your, I'd rather your basis rest on God's word and God's authority than the needs of a church or a ministry or the needs in the world. Would you agree with that? Amen. Very important. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, remember this, and this is crystal clear, common sense is what, it, what, it, what the, Bible, the Apostle Paul is saying. A farmer who plants only a few seeds would get only what? Only a small crop. That makes sense. We have a tomato, Emily planted, we had just a couple of pots on our patio with a few plants. And it's cool, we ate our first pepper the other day, and that thing was 
nice and hot. It's beyond a jalapeno. It was awesome. I was just chewing that thing down because I like hot stuff. Um, but we're not going to get a huge harvest because we've only planted a couple of plants. Guess what? If we want a bigger harvest, what do we have to do? Get more seeds and plant on more ground, right? He says this, you must, but he, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. So some people go, yeah, but he's not talking about money here. I don't know. I don't know what you're reading, but it says, you must each decide, the next verse, in your heart how much you want to give. And don't give reluctantly in response to pressure. Linda, this is what I'm talking about. If you're only giving because I convince you, that's not the best basis for giving. The best basis for giving is not, not reluctantly in response to pressure, but to let, your, to let your basis rest on God's authority and God's word. And so it says, uh, and God, it says, for God loves a cheerful giver or a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So listen, if you, if you have a hard time with, with giving offerings to the Lord, you should read this as many times as you need to get it deep inside of you. I was talking about a young adult couple in our church that's been tithing ever since I, ever since I got married, even before that, and that comes from good upbringing. Their parents taught them, and I'm not going to point them out right now, but I was telling Emily the other day, you know, it, it always impresses me when a young couple decides to be to be tithers, week in, week out, in good times, in bad times, if you put your offering first, well, man, you're just up there trying to get money for people. Hey, this is a principle I lived. You know, the pastor, when I got born again, the pastor came to my house. You know one of the first principles he taught me? The very first night I had a pastor in my house, he said, are you tithing yet? These days, if, we, if I were to go to somebody's house brand new to the church, hey, you tithing? They'd be like, that guy only wants my money. I didn't get offended. Instead, I let him talk to me and teach me this principle. I became a tither on day one. I've been a tither every year. I think this year we gave almost 20% of our income to the Lord. I'm not bragging, but I'm saying that's why God provides for us. I'm not dependent on this church to take care of me. I, God is my provider because I've always put my offering first. I issue a challenge to everyone in here who's never stepped into tithing. And you go, I can't afford to tithe right now. You don't understand what I'm going through. I... I hear churches are doing this around the nation right now. I issue a 90-day challenge. You're not going to lose your car in 90 days or your house in 90 days. <laughs> uh, I dare you to put your tithe first for about 90 days of your life and watch what happens. It's tough getting out of one economy into, into another one. The economy of trusting yourself and your energy and your job and your efforts to trust in God. But I bet if you'll do that, you can get out of you know, one way of living and into a better way of living. So amen. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering this morning. Um, Heavenly Father, as we're getting ready to receive this offering this morning, and uh, Marcy's going to come forward and she's going to do the announcements while that's being received, I want to ask you right now to move in this church. I know a lot of people in this community and around this nation are starting to struggle. In third world countries, they, they know what that's about. But in America, we lived in a long time of just easy prosperity. Now we're in a time where it's a little more difficult to earn money and to earn enough to pay bills. Even more necessary for us to trust in you. And I pray now that you would create a culture of giving in this church so that you can create a culture of receiving and blessing in this church. And I pray, God, and I, I come against the curse of lack and poverty, and I ask you to bless everyone in this ministry. God, I think about tithers like Robbie and Melanie. And this week, Robbie gets this beast of a motorcycle. You know, I get excited because they are tithers. They're hard workers. They're giver, givers. And God, I love to see people do well who are doing it right. And I just pray a blessing over this church financially. financially over the people here. In Jesus' name, amen. And that was a little long, you guys, but that was necessary. I've been needing to say that for a long time. Uh, as we're doing this, Marcy is going to come forward. She's going to do the rest of our announcements. You guys are saving that offering song for the end of what she's doing. Okay, guys. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for that offering. I'll just say this ahead of time. It's always such a, uh, such a blessing. People always take such good care of us. 
And I want to say that uh, my son's watching online. He's on his way back from Richmond. He, he rode his bike 117 miles to Richmond. He's never rode over, like, he never rode over 20 miles before. And he wanted to go up. And what did he say to us? What did he say in my text? He said uh, something like, uh, uh, haters are my fuel or something like that. Because Emily and I were all being safety freak on him. We're like, yeah, but you need a helmet. You need, which, I mean, good parenting, hashtag, right? So we were like, you know, you need, you need water, you need this, you need that. He's like, I'm doing it. So he goes from 20 to 117, which is characteristic of Corey. And uh, so he's on his way back from Richmond. He'll be here in a little while, but he's watching. Uh, he's watching online. So I just want to say good morning to you and speed to get here. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, children, you guys can be dismissed to uh, your classes. And the energy just left the building. Everybody got quiet on me. All right, they're setting up bounce houses outside. Uh, and that, by the way, adults can get in those as well. So, and I know I will. I'm just going to wait for all the shenanigans to take place here, switching around, moving around, all that. Uh, reach over and say hello to somebody. Tell them I think the service is going well so far. Say, I can feel it. It's getting, it's going to be good. All right. How are you? Good to see you today. Okay, so final part in the Super You series, which uh, I, I might have made the decision this morning I'm going to write a book called Super You, because uh, I just, uh, there's lots of content in this, and I, and I just believe there's some good stuff that people need to get. So be praying about that, because um, I, I, I think I could rip this book out by the end of summer, and uh, it, could be, it could be powerful. So uh, we're going to do the final part today, saving the world one relationship at a time. I, I believe that uh, if you improve your relationships, then you'll start to have greater happiness uh, and greater success in life, a success that comes from knowing that you, uh, that, you've, that, you've, that you matter to someone. That's the greatest kind of success. I mean, to have a lot of things and you're sitting in your, you know, your perfect, your great house and you, you rode the right car and they're sitting in your nice garage and you got this great life, but nobody thanks God for you? Think about it. Is that real success? So he goes, well, it's not about you. No, it's not about you, but it's about you knowing that you're, you're mattering to people in this world. I think that's the greatest measurement of success, to know that you matter to people around you. And the only way that can happen is you've got you've to start to uh, you gotta lean into God's grace because I believe, I, I still believe, I know the world comes down on Christians, I still believe that, that good Christians are the greatest people on earth. I believe you're the salt of the earth, you're the light on a hill, you're a city on a hill, you're the light of the world, no question about it. Why? Because God will fill you with, with, with empowerment for you to go out there and care about other people. And so you, I believe that you can save the world one relationship at a time. And I said, by focusing on five types of relationships that I covered in this series, I talked about super, uh, Emily preached the first time super moms, and it was humorous and powerful. And then I talked about super sidekicks super sweethearts, and super friends. And today I'm going to finish the message by talking about um, super Christians. God wants you to become a super Christian. And, uh, and so uh, this is kind of funny, this picture here. It says, uh, it says uh, no, I didn't claim to have actual, I don't claim to have actual superpowers. And there's a guy in his super Christian uh, a costume. And it says, uh, but I do behave myself more when I wear this outfit. I, it made me think to myself how much better we would be as Christians if we wore outfits like this. You know, boom, I'm a Christian. I think sometimes we forget, don't we? Come on, guys. I think sometimes we forget, and it would be great if we all had to wear those. Uh, that, I know you're afraid you're in a cult right now. Uh, they're going to hand you a costume that you'll need to wear for the rest of your life. Um, but on the heels of last Sunday, we talked about graduation. And it's still fresh in our minds, graduation, because, you know, this week, the graduations, the last couple weeks, graduations are taking place. And I want to say congratulations again. Those of you who graduated out of kindergarten, they're not in here now. Uh, those of you who graduated out of high school, and those of you who graduated out of college, let's hear it again for them. <laughs> graduations. Remind us, remind us to labor for growth in our lives. You watch a person graduate, and you go, what am I doing with my life? I got to step up. And especially in your walk with God, that we need to mature into a faith that is measured by giving instead of getting. One of the greatest transformations God has for you. You guys moved around today. 
One of the greatest transformations God has for you is to transform you or to change you from being a consumer into being a contributor. That is not easy. In other words, from being self selfish to being selfless. That's very hard to do. It's very difficult, and you will complain the whole time while God's trying to turn you into that person. Um, it, it's it's kind of like you're bit, and you're going into the turning into vampire phase. It's a bad analogy. Uh, <laughs> but there's that period of time you're like, ah, I want to be about me. I want to cling to me. And God's trying to make you about others, and it's really tough going through that transformation. And uh, I believe, I mean, I believe in God's promises to you. I believe in faith and healings and miracles and prosperity. Do you believe that for your life? I hope you do. Um, it would be terrible to have a belief that God wants you poor and broke and sick and, you know, die young and everything like that. When I read the Bible, I believe that God is great, and I believe that I have authority over darkness. And I, as a believer in Christ, I have authority over darkness, and I believe that I was born to thrive. Say that with me. I was born to thrive. Were you born to thrive? Say yes, man. I mean, serious. But, but thriving is not the pinnacle for a Christian. Thriving is not the pinnacle. There is more to life than getting and having. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Shout more. more. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. It's more blessed to bless others than it is to be blessed yourself. Can you say yes to that? It is fun. I love on Christmas time receiving gifts, but there's no greater feeling than when I give a gift that somebody goes, yes, like these flip-flops right here. Emily got me these. I had no idea. These are, these are high-quality flip-flops. I mean, if I threw this at somebody, I could knock you out cold. Uh, but these things are powerful. I forget the name brand of them. Uh, they're a Hawaiian brand. And uh, she gave those to me this morning. She said, Charlie, I'm not going to. Here's your Father's Day present ahead of time. So it's actually Father's Day present. So I don't want to get it for my birthday. Maybe new surfboard or something. Uh, but, uh, but so mature Christianity, mature Christianity is a giving Christianity. Say this with me. As a Christian, by essence of my nature, I am a giving person. That's awesome, man. Think about it. I'm a giving person. And so... And so Christianity, mere Christi mature Christianity is having a crystal awareness of others' struggles mixed with a desire to help them. Yeah? yeah? It's not rushing from place to place blind to the people laying down on the side of the road and what they're going through. What does mature Christianity have to do with relationships, some people would say? Everything, because you can't impact someone for time and eternity unless you relate with them. True? I love church programs, and I love all the stuff we're doing in the church. But, man, if there's no relationships forming in the church, people aren't going to stay. Their lives are not going to be changed. It's about relationships, more important than anything you can, than you can do. Um, think about the gospel that saves people, the message that we read, the books of the Bible, uh, the message of Jesus. Jesus Christ, at the very center of it, he humbled himself and he came to a fallen earth, and what did he do? He lived among the common people. That's mind-blowing. I, I, I got a thought here. I, I, for Jesus, coming here must have been like camping in the slums. He left heaven, didn't he? Or in a hospital, or in a prison, or in a mental facility. As soon as you're calling us mental, yeah, compared to him. <laughs> you know the way you act sometimes. God doesn't act like that. He's cool all the time, man. He's calm all the time. He's patient. He's full of joy. He's not up and down. He's not all over the place. He's not bipolar. And so, and so it's true when you think about how ignorant, sickly, and foul we are as humans compared to him. But yet he left heaven, and he came here, and he lived, and he walked with us. And you know what? He'll hang out with you, Doug. He'll hang out with you. He'll hang out with you, Brandy. I'm, I'm not... I'm not trying to pick anybody out here. He'll hang out with you, Caleb. I mean, Jesus says, yeah, I'll hang out with you. You don't, have to, you don't have to hit a certain level of cool for me to hang out with you. You don't have to have a certain amount of money for me to hang out with you. You don't have to be smart for me to hang out with you. I'll hang out with everyone that's so loving of God. Jesus emptied himself in Philippians chapter 2, the kenosis. Uh, he, he emptied, he poured out himself. Listen, in other words, 
He dumbed himself down to a degree. He poured out everything so that he could come and he could relate with Charlie and with Charlie. Two Charlies here. It's like looking in the mirror here, except more hair. Uh, just a little bit more hair. Um, just a very little bit. Um, everyone would be probably pretty excited if a president were to come and come to your house. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. It'd be cool to have that entourage pull up into your property. And the president walks in and goes, hey, Linda, just want to tell you you're doing a good job in the world. <laughs> wouldn't that be fun? Yes, it would. I, I tell you right now, it wouldn't matter to me at all. president comes to my house. I might tell a president, you know, I think, I think you're doing a good job, but I think you could do it better. And here's how. Amen. Come on, guys. You, can, you all want to do that to a president at some point. Um, but it's tough running the country, and I'll just say, leave it at that. Uh, you know, but... Greater than that, God came to earth and he hung out with us. I, I think it's unfathomable to, to, to believe that even God in his essence is omnipresent, which gives him the ability to be my best friend and your best friend at the same time. It gives him the ability to go to your prayer time and your devotions and hear all your prayers and be at my house too every morning for millions of people. That's mind-blowing, my friend. And it's awesome. This, this, this is big, and that he will spend one, on time, one time with people. And, uh, but as humans, we are limited to the number of people we can impact, and we're, people are always coming in and out of our lives, and we must learn to see the real opportunities that exist to build relationships with people. Are you all still with me? As uh, Kristen said this when I was talking to her about it the other day, she said, you know, as we're burned by people, and as we also, as we make mistakes in our relationships... And we, and we feel condemned, and we feel guilty, we have a tendency to seek isolation. She said, but we can't do that. We have to let people in. Whoa, man, that is powerful. And there are a lot of people I'm looking out. There's a lot of people, maybe you're in isolation right now because something happened to you, or you failed in a relationship, and you're just like, man, I'm just, I'm just going to be by myself. I'm the only person I can really relate with. Well, you don't quit. Keep trying. You can relate with people. The super Christian is one who fully allows God to move through them with his power to love other people. That's what a super Christian is. One who's allowing God to flow through them. Are you allowing God? Say yes. That's just an affirmation. Maybe. I don't know. Hopefully you are. What does the world need from Christians? Jesus searched for sinners not to condemn them. Jesus showed perfect love. For the worst people, not excluding anyone. Do you think that's cool about God? He got dirty. He put himself in harm's way. He allowed himself. He welcomed inconvenience. That's awesome. I I try to avoid inconvenience. How about you? I try to avoid getting dirty. I'm sure there's people out there who love getting dirty. Uh, You know, I, I, I I try to stay clean. I shower often. I brush my teeth a couple times a day. I try, I'm saying that for what Emily said a couple weeks ago. Um, those of you who come to church all the time, you get the jokes from the entire series instead of one service. Um, look at this. For John came, Matthew chapter 11, neither eating or drinking, and they say he's got a demon. The son of man comes eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved by our deeds. A friend. They said Jesus is a friend of tax collectors and sinners. That's awesome. Jesus, the friend of sinners. The friend of sinners. Look at this one here. The Pharisees and teachers of law muttered. Now, by the way, they were bothered about this. And you know, I, that's the problem with maturing Christi- Christians. And let me say this. I wrote this. I think I wrote this in my book. One of the problems with a maturing Christian is this. You forget you used to sin a lot. And you don't realize you still do. I just added that. Here's what happens. You forgot you were at rock bottom. You forgot the F word used to come out of your mouth all the time. You forgot that. You forgot you used to smoke pot, used to drink, other drugs. You forgot you used to cheat, steal, whatever you did. You forgot. And then God gave you mercy. And here you are 20, 30 years later. And look at you, man. In church, hands raised up. You're a giver. You're helping people. And that's awesome. Unless your righteousness, which came from Christ, starts to become self-righteousness. 
And then the gap between where you are and where you were is so big, you no longer can relate with people who are where you once were. That's a dangerous place to live. You always have to keep yourself humble and never forget, no matter how righteous you are, it's all about what happened on the cross. And he gets all the credit for our life. Chuck's not a better person than other people in this room. Christ's blood flowed into my life and changed me. Amen. Take that away. Don't take that away. But David understood that. He said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. It was like he had this feeling like he'd sinned against God. He's like, whoa, God, don't take it away. I feel like that. Don't ever take it away, God, because it is the source of everything inside of me. Amen. Wow. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So, and, 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 uh, so today, I want to I talk to you, uh, you know, in John chapter 4, which, by the way, John's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, if you read Matthew, it's written to the Jewish people. And it uses language like this. And this Jesus did so that it might be fulfilled that which was written through the prophets. You see that language over and over and over. Why? Because to the Jewish people, it's very important that he is the Messiah tethered to the Old Testament, fulfilling prophecy. In the book of Luke, Luke writes as a physician, as a Greek physician, Luke writes to the Greek mind, which is about study. They're about learning. And Luke's is all about the teachings of Christ. I'm not making this up. There's huge emphasis on this if you read the Gospels. Mark he writes to the Roman mind. His gospel is shorter. He's a gospel of action. And he, he depicts Jesus as a conquering servant, which is a foreign concept to the Roman mind. When you get to John's gospel, John, John's gospel is written to the whosoever. That's why people print the gospel of John and take it to other countries, because John, it gives me chills thinking about it, John's gospel uniquely apart from the other Gospels, is filled with one-on-one -on -one accounts. Jesus, one-on-one, -on -one, he's in front of one person, doing life with one person. And one of those particular, one of those, when you read John's Gospel, you go, wow, Jesus came to the earth not for the world, but for me. In John chapter 4, Jesus, and, and Jesus seems to take, now, you have Judea and you have Galilee in the middle of Samaria. In, in, the time, in the Bible times, Samaria, Samaria was despised by the Jewish people. In fact, so much that on pilgrimages, the people from Galilee would go across the Jordan and down Perea and back into, into Judea to go to Jerusalem during, during festivals. They would go back out. They would go up. It was longer, but that's what they would do. They would avoid Samaria. But Jesus, one of the first things he does in his ministry is he goes, I need to go through Samaria. And he goes straight up through Samaria. And the first stop is in this village. In this village, look at, man, in this village, he's one on one at a well with a woman. While his disciples go to get food, he tells them later, I don't need food right now because I'm high on this moment I had with this woman changing her life. Yeah. I eat of a meat you know not of. I'm nourished by doing the work of God. And here's the neat thing. The neat thing isn't that he went. The neat thing is that he specific. I don't think it's a stretch. He specifically went through Samaria just for one person. Amen. He stops at the well, not worried about water or food, being fueled with nourishment that comes from giving. He spent the day with the lady there. Cu custom con condemned this interaction, but he did it anyway. He talked with her about life, and he answered her questions. He spoke to her prophetically through the Holy Spirit. He changed her life with intentional interaction, setting an example of how we, too, should save the world one relationship at a time. Awesome. Powerful. That This is the model Jesus left us. So today, I'm going to say to you, if you want to be a super Christian, do you want to? Then, then you're going to do this by making three offers to people. Three offers. It's about the offering of your life to other people. If you want to be a super Christian, it's about you giving yourself away. These are costly offers, I'm going to tell you, and they will come from the core of you. They will come from the core of your being. They will require sacrifice. It takes sacrifice to save people. Ask any rescue worker. It takes sacrifice to save people. Ask anyone who served in the military. It takes sacrifice to save someone. Amen? It takes sacrifice. 
giving these offers doesn't come natural for most people. It requires effort and training your heart to be more Christ-like. You want to do that? Me too. In Luke chapter 10, this is our main text for the day, Jesus replied, a man was going from, uh, a man was going, a man was, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers. You've heard the story a lot, but let me give you a couple of thoughts to consider. First of all, this man who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho, which you've heard me say it before, the, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, I think it's like about 30 miles and it's downhill, and there were lots of robbers on that path. In fact, the path was referred to as the bloody way because there was so much blood and death and stealing going on in this path. There's such a message in this story of the Good Samaritan. There's a man who's on that path, and he was going, and it says that he fell among robbers. This man is an illustration of unchurched, unsaved people who are apart from God, who he fell. He didn't plan to end up there. He fell among robbers. The Bible says in John chapter 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the full. You know what he's saying? I'm the good Samaritan. I'm the one who stops to help you along the way. This man fell among thieves, among robbers. And it says, the robbers stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead, which is the world's condition. People are alive, but they're dead inside. They're half dead. Are you seeing this? Now, by chance, a priest was going down by the road. This is a type of the modern, modern-day church, so preoccupied with our own lives, so up on a high horse, not willing to stop and help those who have fallen among robbers and are half dead. Look at this. It says, uh, there was a priest. He was going down the road, and while he saw him, he, he said he saw him, but he passed on the other side. And there was a Levite, and he came to the place, and he saw him, and he says, he saw him, and he passed on the other side. An illustration of how church people often treat unchurched, unsafe people. Oh, I'm going to go away. That's complicated. Come on. That's complicated, that's dirty, that's going to require something from me, an offering from me, I'm, not, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to take the path of least resistance. And that's why C.T. Studd said some people want to live in the sound of church and chapel bell, but I want to run a rescue mission a yard from the gates of hell. Any of those kind of people in here? The whole church is filled with those kinds of people. Amen. And so um, it says, but a, but a Samaritan, in one translation it says a despised Samaritan. This is crazy. This is a Samaritan. This is a humble man who had not forgotten where he came from, obviously. As he journeyed, he came to where the guy was. He saw him. He had compassion. And he went to him and bound his wounds, pouring, wounds, pouring oil and wine. One translation says medicine and putting bandages on his wounds. It's even possible the guy maybe was a doctor. He seemed to know how to care for this man. And it says, then he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to the inn. He took care of him the next day. He gave two denarii uh, and gave them to the innkeeper, which a denarii was about a day's worth of wages. So he gave about two days' wages to this uh, innkeeper. And then he says to him, I'll be back in a while on my journey, and if you need anything else then, I'll take care of it. Whatever he needs, put it on my tab. Man, don't you wish you could be that kind of Christian? Come on, let's just be honest. We're probably not, are we? Uh, we're, we're, you know, we want to be. I want to be that kind of Christian. But sometimes I can't. This sermon is to help you be that kind of Christian. Here is the first offer that I believe you need to make with your life if you want to be that kind of super Christian. That's the model, the Good Samaritan. Say that with me. I desire with all my heart to be that kind of Christian, the Good Samaritan. That's leveling up, man. That's, that's level up mature Christianity. And we want to get there, right? So the first offer you're going to make is your acceptance. Your acceptance. Look at somebody next to you and say, I accept you just the way you are. Now this message, this point could create some controversy because people are wiggling already going, I'm not going to accept certain kinds of people. Okay, let me make my point. To the two Jewish ministers that passed by this guy, the two in the story, 
They were leaders in the church. A Pharisee who was known for being a person of the law. A Levite who was known for being a person who handles the worship. These are two high-level church leaders. For them, they looked at the man, turned up their nose, and went by the other way. It's a little bit of a stretch, but I would say that, that these other men were obviously disgusted with the inconvenience of happening upon this event. Do you think that probably happened? Oh, man. You know, gosh, these people everywhere. You know, uh, they, they must have prejudged this man. A little bit of a stretch. What, he, what do you think he, I wonder what he did to put himself in that position. Oh, man. I bet he was, I, what was he even doing on this road in the first place? I, 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 I don't even, I bet he was out partying all night. And I, I bet this, making all kinds of assumptions about this man. Because, and it'll be up on the screen, self-righteous people always find a reason to disqualify a person in need. We got to get that out of our hearts. I was in Virginia Beach. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about this message a couple weeks ago, and I was like, man, I want to live this every day of my life, and I'm trying to create new habits in my life to pay attention to people. And so I ended up, I ended up, I saw this homeless guy, and he had buckets in his cart. And I sat down with him and started talking to him. I didn't, I didn't say, hey, John 3.16 says, blah, 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 play the sinner's prayer with me on my go. I wanted to hear this guy out. I wanted to hear this guy out, you know, and just let him tell me a story. How'd you end up here? Oh, man, you know. Fell into misfortune a couple years ago. I couldn't pay my bills. And then I was like, hey, you know, and this and that. I, said, I used to be a drummer. Oh, man, I used to be a drummer. I said, how did you start playing the buckets? I used to be a drummer. I'm thinking, here's a drummer on the outside. I bet God wants to bring him into his kingdom and have him drum for him, little drummer boy, offering his gift to God. And he's out there, and, you know, and he's, he's, he's of course, he's, he told me, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not a Christian. I'm not, close to, I'm not close to God in any way. But he said, I said to him, um, I said, what is it like? What is it like being out here, man? I said, he said, for, he says to me, thank you for stopping and talking to me. He said, nobody ever sits down just to talk. And I said, wow, that breaks my heart, man. He said, oh yeah. I, he said, he said, and he tell, starts telling me, I, I, I arranged this into some points. He said, some people are irritated. They yell at me, get a job, bum. Some people don't even see me. They think if I don't look, I don't have to care. He said, other people, some are moved with compassion. They, I wrote this. They feel thankful for God, for, to God for their lives, and they haven't forgotten where they came from, and they help. Some people, like, like myself that day, I was inspired by this man. I thought, you live out here with nothing all summer? Dude. You're powerful. I couldn't get any amens from that. Linda high five me because I made her. <laughs> Man, guys, I'm inspired sometimes by homeless people. I don't expect everybody to agree with me. But I, I'm inspired when I see somebody out on the street struggling to live, having to eat some of the junk they have to eat. So, well, they could get a job. No, you don't understand. When you've fallen down that low, it's hard for you to, the gap between what it takes for you to get back up is so high. Instead of judging, man, we need to develop a heart that accepts people right where they are. You know what? You're awesome. I, when I told him he inspired me, he started to bawl. Started, tears started coming in. I said, you inspire me. You live out here all summer. You've been doing this for six years of your life. How often do you play those drums? Oh, I play them all day long, every, everywhere. Um, I, I think being a super Christian, and by the way, I got to, I got to pray with him. He he cried out to God. It was so powerful. The moment that we had, I, God changed that guy's life. Being a Christian begins with your attitude. It's about what you believe about others and their circumstances. Some Christians feel, I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to go down to those bums and I'm going to go give them Jesus. That kind of attitude doesn't save people. We used to, I remember years ago we did the homeless. One of the first epiphanies I had was, and when Gerald Mayhem would go, go ahead and preach. I'm going to turn you loose. You know how he is. I'm going to turn you loose, Pastor Chuck. All right, turn me loose. And the first couple of years, I was just preaching hardcore. And then one year, I, I looked at people and I said, I want you to know we're not the rich people 
coming down in to the streets, bringing our wealth to you, unfortunate people. We're, we're all in this together. We're all humans in this together. I started lowering myself so I could be eye to eye with these people. And I started realizing I'm never going to really reach them if I'm on a pedestal. There's a breakdown in relationship. There's a barrier when you're up higher than everyone else. Do people irritate you? Do they disgust you? Are they invisible to you? To relate with people, you can't come off like you're above them. Don't be forceful about the changes people need to make. Yeah, but, you know, these sinners, I got I to gotta, I gotta make them change. You don't have to make anybody change. It, it, I always say this. Some people, a person will give their life to Christ at 40. Then you find a 20-year-old, and you want to force them to change 20 years before you did, and you're irritated that they don't. That rotten person, so were you for 20 more years. Give them a break, man. God is patient. Thank God he is patient, right? Thank God he's patient. Give freedom, which allows people to choose the higher level as they see it modeled in you. That's the way this should happen. We are not called to preach down on sinners. Jesus preached up to sinners, compelling them up to the higher life. He preached up to people. But the Good Samaritan, notice Jesus didn't, uh, Jesus, who is, by the way, the Good Samaritan, if you look at it in Scripture, it's capital G, uh, capital G, capital S. This is a reference to God. This is a reference to Jesus here. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. So notice that Jesus, as the Good Samaritan, didn't, bend down to lecture the man about being on that road and getting himself into that situation. It didn't matter to Jesus how it happened. He accepted the man exactly as he was, and he helped him. Come on, guys. Man, as long as you are prejudiced to different kinds of people, you'll never make the difference that God wants you to make. There's only a certain kind of people you like to minister to. No, how about the kind that's on the road half dead? Only qualification. Half dead, down on the road, I'm there. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you have or don't have. I don't care what you can give me. I'm just going to bend down and I'm going to help you. Today's Christian does too much speculating and not enough assisting. I'm not trying to get on the soapbox. I'm not trying to be a mean preacher this morning. But these are some observations I made. Now listen to this. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they turned down, right? They, they turned away. Everybody's with the story, right? So here's what happens. Holier than thou. This is what Jesus called those people. He said, you people are holier than thou. You have this attitude that says, don't touch me. Looking for someone here. How about you, Lisa? Because you come out of a big drug background. And, you know, I've been in the church all my life, which I haven't. I just don't get people like you, you know. And so, so you go to shake my hand. I'm like, ah, sanitizer. <laughs> sanitizer. Drugs. Drug. No, man. And, you know, believe it or not, there are people like that. I told you a while back there, are, I, I've, two different churches in this area have contacted me over the last 10 years to say, uh, we got some, get, one time was gang members, we got some gang members started visiting our church, and we know your church accepts those kinds of people, would you mind taking them, you're more experienced with them. He didn't say accepts, he said your church is more experienced, yeah, we know what you're trying to say. You don't want them because they're going to take up a seat and not give an offering plate. Jesus didn't do that. He said, don't tell the rich people you come sit here and the poor people you go sit in the back. He says, you be, you be Christ to everyone. Right? Amen. I'll tell you what, Lisa's one of the greatest Christians I know today. And God pulled her out of the very bottom. And I thank God when he walked by, when he walked by her, he didn't have a certain criteria. He just bent down and helped. He bent down and lifted her up. See, I, here's the way it actually works. Um, Holier than thou is an attitude that says, I've got one up on you. Holier than thou is an attitude that says, I've got one up on you. Look at this, look at this picture here. It's kind of funny. I'm getting tired of you holier than of your holier than thou attitude. They're both cheese. Come on, guys, right? <laughs> uh, don't be like the holier than thou Christian that says, You better watch your language around me, son. Now, look, I'm not trying to make people mad because I know in a crowd this size, people have said that. I thought like that a couple of times in my life. People don't need to clean up to get around you. They don't even need to clean up to get around God. He cleans people up. 
Religion is man's, it's human, it's, it's humanity trying to please God. Salvation is God changing people. It's God, it's God transformation. Jesus avoided stuck up people. He made them mad. Um, he let them walk away and he did nothing to beg them back. Holier than thou people. It's amazing, he never was turned off by sinners. Only by, sinner, only by sinners who thought they weren't sinners and better than sinners. And that's the people. Instead, Jesus went to the half-dead people who needed a physician. He says, I can't go to the people who don't think they need a physician, but I'm going to those who need a physician. That's who I'm going to go to. So let the sinner be a sinner while they're being naturally drawn to Christ. Amen? Say yes. So um, people don't need to clean up before they approach God. They're cleaned from the relationship by God's grace, not for the relationship by human works. That's doctrine. That's that's in the doctrine of salvation. It's very important that you understand that. God changes your life, and he gets the credit. If Jesus spent time with, the Bible uses this terminology, so don't get mad at me. The Pharisees said, look at Jesus over there, spending time with the scum of the earth. Called him the scum of the earth. If Jesus Christ will spend time with the scum of the earth, how are you too holy for certain kinds of people? Think about it, man. We're all just sinners saved by grace. We're 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 all in the same. We're all cheese. So look at this. Um, you may say, but acceptance gives a license to sin, doesn't it? No, acceptance is the attitude of love. It's the attitude of love that leads people to Christ. You can disagree with a person's lifestyle without spitting in their face with disgust. Come on, guys. Listen, man, it's about angry Christians, man. Angry Christians. Sean Foyt said this a couple weeks ago. He said, I'm going to deal with the uptight Christians. Corey and I went to this thing in Virginia Beach, and he said, I want everybody to put your hand on the shoulder. So Corey and I, we hardly ever touch. I know it's terrible. I'd love to hug my kids. Neither one of them let me hug me much. You guys talk to him about it. I appreciate it. And uh, so he says, hug the person. It's just Corey and I on the one row. So Corey and I have to put our arms around each other. Of course, I'm like this, right? So we got our arms around each other. And he said, now sway a little bit. I'm like, oh, God, this is really charismatic here. I'm swaying with my son. I'm loving it but feeling also uncomfortable. I'm kind of looking at the corner of my eyes to see how Corey's reacting. But I got to spend this, this, uh, this awesome time. My God, I was telling you a great story there, and I just forgot. Uh, come on. Oh, Sean Foyt said, he said, I'm, you know what I'm dealing with right now? I'm dealing with angry Christianity. He said, you need to loosen up some and stop being so angry at the world. And it's true. Angry Christianity is not going to bring anyone to Christ or make anyone want to come to church. Man, so we need to deal with that, right? So if you want to be a super Christian, offer acceptance to others. Offer to, offer your attention. Offer your attention. Everybody do this, go. Not much. Uh, Notice the Samaritan made time in his schedule to help people. This is a hard one for me. Uh, There's there's so many lost and needy people in the world, it's hard to figure out, get enough time to try to help everyone. In fact, you know, I deal with depression a lot. I have dealt with depression a lot in my life. Thank God by his grace, he's brought me through. It's unbelievable. But one of my triggers is when I can't be there for someone. That, believe it or not, that throw, that could, that has thrown me into depression. And especially if people get mad about it, and it's like, oh, well, you know, he was supposed to do this, and he didn't follow through because I wake up every day and I want to make a difference. If you really want to make a difference, it hurts when you think you're not. That's one of my triggers, to think I'm not there for someone. I'm not, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a burden on my life. Um, Jesus started each day with time or margin in his life for other people. Can you imagine? I mean, if I'm God and I'm coming to earth, I'm like, I'm on a schedule. I got three years to change, to save the world. I don't have time for the woman at the well. I don't have time for, uh, a blind, for, for blind Bartimaeus. I don't have time for Nicodemus. I don't have time. Nicodemus, seriously. It's nighttime. I need to get some rest. I got to get up and preach tomorrow. I got to get my body rested. No, Jesus gave himself. He, he made time for people. This is a tough one for some, and it's easy for others, but the Bible says the king will say to those on the right, come, at the end of time, at the end of time, after life, 
Come, be blessed of my Father, enter the kingdom prepared for you from the time of the uh, creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and watch, you visited me. Don't look to your own interests, but also take an interest in others, Philippians 2, 4. So attention is even greater than time. Yeah, I'm with you, but I'm not really with you. I've been trying so hard to just get off my phone when I'm talking to people, man. Just look them in the eyes and be like, hey, how's life? It's, it's so rude, man, to be constantly on devices, man. How in the world are we going to... And You know what I'm saying, man? It's like sometimes turn, even turn the TV off, man, and just be like, hey, how's life? Landon comes to me yesterday. I'll go to the campground or the day before yesterday. He, we sit down. He goes, so, how was your day? I'm like, you're six, and you got it. He's taking an interest in other people. So how's your day? Look at somebody say, so how's your day? All right, hey, just good news. I'll be done in about, about nine minutes maximum. And the good news is you don't have to go buy lunch today. Hopefully you gave that money in my birthday offering. And you get to, you get to uh, go have food and lots of fun. We're going to watch some people get baptized. So this is a perfect day for me to preach long if I wanted to. And it's still only 11.23, so I'm doing well. Attention is about you being in the moment you have offered to someone. So it's not just about giving time, it's about giving attention. It's about, it's about being in the moment that you've offered to someone. Christian said this, Christian, we talked about the message a lot this week. Uh, Christian said, you know, this is, she said, it's kind of like this, when I have people come into my office sometimes, because she led a guy to the Lord who staggered in off the parking lot one day, and she led him to the Lord. This is a good example. A lot of people go, hey, man, I'm working a job. I don't have time. You know, hey, nice. I'll hook you up with the preacher. So he wanted a preacher, didn't he? She was like, he wanted a preacher. I was like, okay, he got one. And uh, so she's like, uh, she's like, okay, well, come on into my office. Actually, Joyce, I think, was uh, your mom was working the reception. She said, Christian, there's this guy here. So Christian brings him back into his, her office. And she's got this guy in her office. And he starts talking about God and everything else. And Christian, she, she leads him to Christ, man. Sinner's prayer. I mean, all out, the guy gives his life to Christ. Totally awesome, man. Right? That's a high. That's a high. And uh, she says to me the other day, she goes, sometimes when I'm in my office and I have somebody in there, she said, I'm tempted to look at the computer. Um, you know, I want to look at the computer. But I make a decision that this could be a divine opportunity for me to make a difference. That's awesome. What do you have to turn away from to be in the moment with someone? A coworker says, you go, you watch this. Hey, how you been doing? Oh, I'm doing terrible, man. My life's falling apart. Oh, good, man. All right, well, I'll see you later. Come on, right? That's a good example of not giving attention. I've, done, I've actually done that many times. All right, cool, man. That's not cool. That's awesome. And all of a sudden, it sinks in. I go, wow, dude, did you just say all this stuff's happening? I'm so sorry. Right? <laughs> so you have to make time on purpose each day to relate with people so that you can impact them. This is the reason the Good Samaritan can help because he had space in his life to help. He valued people more than things or anything else that he could have desired in life. So the Bible says that we should share one another's burdens in this way, obey the Christ. Okay, uh, the law of Christ. Okay, my last point, my last offer that I'm suggesting each of us make with people is that you offer your assets. Offer your assets. Okay, so I can, I can give acceptance. I personally, I think this is the easiest one. I think the acceptance is probably the hardest part for most people. I don't know. I don't know which one's hard for you. Attention. That's tough, too. But now we're, now we're at assets. You know what? Making a difference in somebody's life is dirty. It's dangerous. Emily said, our dog got hit by a car one time, and he bit Emily when she was trying to help him. And she had this epiphany. She said, that's the way it is in church. We're always getting bit by church people. We're always getting bit by church people. She said, but we can't take it personal because injured people bite. True, isn't it? She goes, I'm going to become cynical because everybody's been mean to me. Grow up, man. Toughen up. Can you take a beating for somebody and look at them and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the kind of love that saves people. Right? That's, that's high-level love that saves people. It's not easy getting there, but that's where we need to go. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment, Jude 23. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Verse 23 says, 
uh, rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment, show mercy, mercy to others, but in doing so, show great compassion or great caution so that you don't fall into their sins. One of my favorite verses, actually, this is the verse I, I, I've told people, this is a verse of my life for many years. And King James, it says, and others saving with fear, snatching them or pulling them out of the flames. And others saving with fear, pulling them out of the flames. I, I saw myself when I got born again, like becoming a rescue worker. And I saw the world on fire. And I said, I'm going to spend my life going into the flames and pulling people out of the flames. That's why this church exists. If you believe in heaven and hell, if you believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, then you believe this church is called to go out into the fire and pull people out. That is, our, that is the primary responsibility of a, of, a, of a follower of Christ. And so like firefighters, you know, in society, that's such a great picture. I thought it was funny that she had her cell phone, though. I thought that was just awesome. Isn't it amazing the stuff we'll save in a fire? But uh, she had her cell phone. But that's a serious photo. I almost thought about not making that joke because it's so serious. I mean, you can tell. I mean, if this guy didn't get up there with that ladder, this woman would have burned to death. But he saved her. And let's hear it for our fire and rescue people from this community that do this all the time. Rescuing so many people every year from this community. Um, but like fire, now, now in society, only certain people step up and volunteer. Well, I'm just not that kind of person, so we leave it to someone else. But listen to this. Like firefighters or rescue squad workers, but in God's kingdom, everyone is called to volunteer to save a life. The good Samaritan did what he could do to help. He bent down, he, he bandaged, he put the guy on his donkey, which would be you know like you putting a bleeding person in your brand new car with your nice leather seats. This guy probably bled all over his donkey. I mean, I don't know how long it took to get that out of the fur. He probably had to shave the donkey after he was done. But the guy was willing to do it. No, I'm not going to have any dirty people over my house. I'm not going to have any dirty people in my vehicles. Man, it's dirty. It's dangerous. It requires sacrifice if you want to change the world. Preaching alone will never change the world. Can you agree with that? Compassion is a relationship builder. When you heal people, they will open their heart to you. That's why we have a huge initiative with Compassion this year. And I hope more and more people get involved every time. You, you will look for it in the Destiny Times, and you'll go, i want to. I got to figure out how I can get involved in the next one. Yeah, how pow powerful it would be. We go on an outreach, and 50 people with DFC shirts are out there helping. Somebody goes, my God, what is that? Oh, it's a church? That's about Christ making a difference. Preaching alone won't do it, but when you heal people, they open their hearts to you. All the walls go down when you make a difference in somebody's life, when you share your assets. You need to offer your physical assets, which would be your, your profession, your talents, your influence, your personal talents, your money, your food. But then also offer your spiritual assets. Peter and John were on their way to prayer in Acts chapter 3, I believe it is. They're on their way to prayer, and there's this man begging. And the man says, please, give me alms, give me, uh, um, give me money. And Peter, Peter looked at the man and said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give you. And he bent down his hand, and he grabbed the man. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. And this paralyzed man was healed by an act of God, by faith and the supernatural gift of miracles operating through Peter. The man rose up and was healed. So when I say give your assets, I'm not just talking about your natural assets. I'm talking about your spiritual ones. Hey, can I pray for you? You know, let's pray about this. Give people the word of God. The word of God, you know, people don't read the Bible. One verse, they can hang on to it. You know, I ran into a Christian person. They gave me this verse written down on a piece of paper. And I've been reading it for years, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then I'll just say finally on spiritual assets, you need to share your story. Doug Brooks preached it. At, uh, uh, by the way, Theresa is the pastor over uh, Shenandoah Acres campground. She, she, every Sunday, she's responsible for preaching down there. There are some more. Really awesome, isn't it? And she, this morning, Doug Brooks spoke down there, and uh, I asked him how it went. He's like, I think it went good, man. It felt really good. You get all these campers that come around, and Doug's sharing his story about how he was delivered off of methamphetamine addiction, and how he got his family back, and how his kids got their life. All these different things. He's staring. He's sharing his story. Your story, man, sometimes people forget. I think to myself, wow, I used to be, 
I used to be on drugs and alcohol and law. I'm in safe for so long, I forget. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell my story. Doug's is better. My story's good. And you know what? Yours doesn't have to be just like mine. Share your story. This is what Christ did in my life. It's an asset you can use that you can offer to other people to save them. One relationship at a time. Let's stand, and I want to make one final statement. I want you to listen very close. Worship team, you guys can come. You guys having fun today being in church? Listen to this very close. Christianity (coughs) is boring when you don't practice it as intended. Sean Foyt, I don't know if I told you, yeah, I told you last week about the Iraq thing. It's just been, no, I told you guys in prayer meeting. Sean Foyt went to Iraq, and he went to the front lines of the battle where there are Kurdish Muslims fighting against ISIS. And, he, and he's standing, he shows pictures of himself standing right next to the tank. This is where the cannons are firing. This is where the battle is taking place, and he's there. He's a Christian worshiper. He says they start talking, and they said, we love Americans. I was like, wow, man, we need to hear more of that. And then, then he says, he goes, we love, we love American Christian singers. And he said, why? I don't understand, but you're Kurdish Muslims. And he said, when, when you sing, we win the battle. Oh, my God. When you sing, they recognize that when Christians come to the front lines, and sing worship to God, they win the battle against ISIS. And I thought to myself when he was speaking, Christianity is boring when you don't do it as practice, as intended. In other words, it's not just for you and your family. It's for you to take it out there and use it on this dying world. That's when life gets fun. Amen? Amen? That's why I said it's a fuller life, and God wants to lead us into it. Would you like to pray for that grace today? That God will uh, give you the ability to make these offers, acceptance, attention, and assets that you will offer these to the world without reserve, that you will give your life away. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray this morning, God, that you would move in our lives. I give you myself, Lord. God, sometimes years of sacrifice and we get worn out, we become cynical, and we offer ourselves with hesitation. I pray today that all of those walls would come down now. And I pray, Father, that we would go out of this church with a burning passion to find someone we can relate with and we can lead to you. Fountain of living water. Son of God. Savior of the world. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for grace. Remove our fears fear of rejection fear of wasting it notice the farmer in the parable Jesus told he put seeds on all the different kinds of paths you don't have to be selective about who you share with give Jesus said when you give to the poor you're lending to God or the Bible says when you give to the poor you lend to God and he's able to repay it You don't have to qualify broken people before you'll help them. Today, Lord, give us your heart. Say that with me. Today, Lord, give us your heart. Today, Jesus, give us your heart. Move in our lives, Father. Let us have a Christianity that is real, that is awesome, that is useful in this earth. I want to ask you today, are you that guy or gal on the path, the bloody way, the downhill descent? You're on the path and you're half dead, you're beaten down. Life has just driven you to rock bottom. And you're going, I need Christ. I need Jesus. I need the Good Samaritan to stop by, to look down, to save my life. Without anybody looking around, if that's you today, Would you give your life to Christ? I'm going to count to three. Maybe you're backslidden. You once walked with God, but there you are, beaten down again. Man, you're spiritually or 
spiritually or physically or both, you're just away right now and you're just going, man, how did I end up like the prodigal son? I want to come home today. I want to renew covenant with God. Today is your day. Today, God's been working on you to get you to this point. And you're here. And he's here. He says, if you'll just let me do my thing, I'll change your life. Without anybody looking around, if that's you, I'm going to count to three. Raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. You want to give your life to Christ. Any of those situations, you want to give your life to Christ. I don't care if it's one or two people. Raise your hand. Give your life to Christ this morning. I just I never, I haven't done this in 12 months. I feel like there's somebody today. And you're just like, I'm, oh man, I want to do it, but I don't know if I can. Just raise your hand. That's all you got to do. I see one hand. Who else? Who else? Raise it up. And I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. I mean it with all your heart. Listen, you can still be born again if you didn't raise your hand. The Bible doesn't say he who raises his hand and then prays a sinner's prayer and comes forward. It's about turning your life over to Christ. We do it like this. We, we add formality to it so that you can see the process better. You want to give your life to Christ this morning? Let's do it right now. Let's pray. Pray with all of your heart and mean it. Dear Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning and I believe the Bible that I was born in sin that I can't save myself. I'm separated from God. I need a Savior. I believe today in Jesus Christ that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no person comes to the Father except through Jesus. So today, I open my heart and I ask you now, Jesus Christ, Savior of the world, Come into my life and save me now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, let's thank God for doing that for some people today. Would you just raise your hands this morning? Let's just worship for a second before we dismiss.
Father, we pray this morning over everyone getting baptized that it would be a very special moment for them. We're going to go out into the parking lot. We're going we're to get around that baptismal tub. We're going to see people go under the water and come up just as an outward sign of what's already happened inside of their soul. A sign to everyone that Jesus Christ is everything. Just like when John the Baptist would baptize people, it was a sign that they had turned away from their sins and turned towards God. I pray, God, those people go under that water today and they come up, that you would completely bless their lives, Lord. New life, God's power. Let it encourage everyone else. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, guys, let's head out to the uh, parking lot. Let's go ahead and do these uh, baptisms.